In point of fact, spirit has already accomplished this in principle. The consciousness that is aware of its disruption and openly de declares it derides existence and the universal confusion and derides its own self as well. It is at the same time the fading but still audible sound of all this confusion. This vanity of all reality and every definite notion, vanity which knows itself to be such, is the double reflection of the real world into itself. Once in this particular self of consciousness qua particular, and again in the pure universality of consciousness or in thought. In the first case, spirit that has come to itself has directed its gaze to the world of actuality and still has there its purpose and immediate content. But in the other case, its gaze is in part turned only inward and negatively against it, and in part is turned away from that world towards heaven, and its object is the beyond of this world. Paragraph 525 is the penultimate paragraph of this section, and we saw that a resolution was taking place in the two previous paragraphs. Uh, now we're getting to see that, you might say, condensing into a determinate form, which is by the end of this paragraph, and then even more determinately in the next paragraph, and then in the paragraphs to come, leading us to a beyond. So... Hegel begins this paragraph by referencing what had just happened in the previous one, saying, in point of fact, spirit has already accomplished this in principle. Um, it has brought it to fulfillment. And in principle here is translating anzik. Um, so intrinsically, um, in itself is probably you know, better than, than just in principle, provided that, that we, we understand that what we mean here is that something has been outlined, something has been initiated, but it's not yet actually done. So what is what is being done? Hegel talks us about this, this transition to a higher consciousness from the spirit of culture. The the way to address the you know discordant and you might say super abundant. Uh, realm of culture where nothing quite seemed to match up to anything else. Things turned into their opposites. Um, and, you know, we had this, this sort of sophisticated consciousness which could talk glibly about all these different things. And then we had a more sullen, as Miller translated, taciturn, uh, honest consciousness, which doesn't really know what to do other than to try to simplify things or, or go back in time. Instead, Hegel says, no, we have to go through this and by doing so, we're going to reach a higher consciousness. And we might ask ourselves, well, what historical period does Hegel have in mind here? Or is this a dynamic that can repeat multiple times? I think it really, we should, we should view it as the latter. So he says, the consciousness, and he's talking here about this sophisticated consciousness that identifies, but also is at a distance from its culture and is, even is discordant with itself. He says, the consciousness that is aware of its disruption and openly declares it derides existence and the universal confusion. What is this universal confusion? The real world, uh, and we might say, well, what do you mean the real world? You know, that of objects? No, the real world of culture, of meanings, which don't turn out to be stable, which don't turn out to be arranged in neat hierarchies where everybody knows their place, which turn out to be uh, subversive and subvertible, right? <clears throat> so he says, it, uh, it derides this universal confusion and derides its own self as well. So what we see here again is, is a repetition of the very dynamic that we saw earlier on several times, most particularly in the section on skepticism, repeated again here in this one. Uh, we should look at the phenomenology as not simply a nice progression where we, we, we're done with one stage and we finish with that and thank God it's behind us and now we move on to the next. We have these sort of cycles where things are getting bigger and more concrete and that's what's happening here. So Hegel says, it's at the same time 
the fading, still audible sound of all this confusion. It's a nice uh, oral metaphor. Um, Hegel actually does talk in this, this passage about a kind of laughter that doesn't make it into the translation. Um, how is the individual consciousness supposed to make sense out of where it is and then move to something higher? It appears as if there's no basis for it to work with anymore. There's nothing it can really rely upon, just a, a heap, uh, as, or to use the, the word that came up earlier, a medley of different notes. So what does this then bring in? Hegel here is going to talk about vanity, eitelkeit. Um, you know, and if we think about what vanity means, I, I, it's useful to distinguish two senses of vanity here in English that are often easily mixed up. You know, for example, in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, where it says, vanity of vanity, all is vanities, which is a sentiment corresponding to this. It doesn't mean that every, everyone is vain in the sense of making too much of themselves. As a matter of fact, what we translate as, as vanity in the original Greek was kenodoxia. Um, and, and kenos means empty. You know, the kenosis that theologians talk about, the emptying that, that the Christ figure to, uh, took on or, or you know, underwent or however you want to talk about it. It's coming from the same word. So vanity means emptiness. And when we talk about a person being vain, that's really a secondary derivative sort of, of meaning, which uh, stems from the fact that they are priding themselves on things that really are empty. Like if you think that because you've got a great car or because uh, you've got a million thumbs up on, on you know, this or that uh, Facebook post or YouTube video that, you know, you're really hot stuff. Um, well, that, I mean, it could be that you are, but... <laughs> In that case, it won't be that thing showing it. Um, you probably have a book or something that you can back it up with. I don't know what you'd do in case of the car thing. But in, in a lot of cases, it really is empty, and people pride themselves on that. Here, it's more the original sense of the emptiness of these things is being revealed. Uh, what do we mean by emptiness? Not just, you know, a void. We mean the fact that they don't stand up under scrutiny, which is what the dialectic has been, to have stable meanings, things that we can rely upon. So he goes on and he talks about the vanity of all reality and every definite notion, every concept. Vanity, which knows itself to be such. Now, that's an interesting thing. In this case, does the negative of a negative turn into a positive? Is, is there an advance in knowing not only that everything else is vain, but even your own attitude towards it is also vain. Is that an advance? Is that a success? Or is that sometimes just a mode of cynicism? Depends on where we're going with this. People do remain moored in this. Uh, Hegel talks about, you know, this double reflection of the real world into itself. It's really an internalization on the part of self-consciousness, which has been taking its cues from the social world, hasn't it? It's been looking to see where it fits in with wealth and state power and trying to understand um, you know, itself as a noble self-consciousness and, and you know, how language fits in. It, it really is connected with the world. And if the world is totally screwed up, that means self-consciousness is going to be screwed up as well. So what is the way forward. Hegel tells us that there's a sort of bifurcation happening here. This awareness of the vanity of everything can happen in the particular self of consciousness, qua particular, as an individual person. Or, he says, and here's where we're going to move into the next section, in the pure universality of consciousness or in thought. Now, that may sound rather abstract, but keep in mind that for Hegel, thought uh, covers quite a, a range. So, you know, it's not as if you, you have feelings and those aren't thought as well, or, you know, pictures and images and those aren't thought. All of that's thought. Just as much as for, you know, somebody like Descartes, for example. Um, you know, 
the kind of thinking that we're doing when we're reasoning, that's thought, right? The, the work of the intellect alone, unaided by imagination. But imagination is also thought. And so is sensations of pain and pleasure. Those are thought as well. Willing is thought. Willing against is thought. We can go on and on and on with this. So Hegel goes on and he says, in the first case, spirit that's come to itself directed its gaze to the world of actuality and still there has its purpose and immediate content. So, you know, maybe it holds down a job or it occupies a certain social role. And even though it feels like this is all BS, none of this really matters, it continues on with it and it, it can find moments of meaning within it. And it doesn't have to be an unhappy state, but that's not where the advance occurs. Hegel says... In the other case, its gaze is in part turned only inward and negatively against it. And in part is turned away from that world towards, now I've got on the board, you know, going downward because I, I started drawing my schema before, uh, you know, deciding exactly what I was going to do. But we could talk about heaven or we could talk about the depths, right? It is turned away from that and the object for that, in terms of no longer just the particular self, but the universality of thought, is this beyond, this jenseits, this, this thing that is outside of the world, outside of self-consciousness. Now, where is that? That's what the entire next section is going to be directing us towards. In that aspect of the return into the self, the vanity of all things is its own vanity, is itself vain. It is the self-centered self that knows not only how to pass judgment on and chatter about everything, but how to give witty expression to the contradiction that is present in the solid elements of the actual world, as also in the fixed determinations posited by judgment, and this contradiction is their truth. Looked at from the point of view of form, it knows everything to be self-alienated, being for self is separated from being in itself, what is meant and purpose are separated from truth, and from both again the being for another, the ostensible meaning from the real meaning, from the true thing and intention. Thus it knows how to give correct expression to each moment in relation to its opposite. In general, how to express accurately the perversion of everything. It knows better than each what each is, no matter what its specific nature is. Since it knows the substantial from the side of the disunion and conflict which are united within the substantial itself, but not from the side of this union, it understands very well how to pass judgment on it, but has lost the ability to comprehend it. This vanity at the same time needs the vanity of all things in order to get from them the consciousness of self. It therefore creates this vanity itself and is the, is the soul that supports it. Power and wealth are the supreme ends of its exertions. It knows that through renunciation and sacrifice it forms itself into the universal, attains to the possession of it, and in this possession is universally recognized and accepted. State power and wealth are the real and acknowledged powers. However, this recognition and acceptance is itself vain, and just by taking possession of power and wealth, it knows them to be without a self of their own, knows rather that, that it is the power over them, while they are vain things. The fact that in possessing them, it is, a, it is itself apart from and beyond them, is exhibited in its witty talk, which is, therefore, its supreme interest and the truth of the whole relationship. In such talk, this particular self, qua this pure self, determined neither by reality nor by thought, develops into a spiritual self that is of truly universal worth. It is the self-disruptive nature of all relationships and the conscious disruption of them, but only as self-consciousness in revolt is it aware of its own disrupted state, and in thus knowing it has immediately risen above it. In that vanity, all content is turned into something negative, which can no longer be grasped as having a positive significance. The positive object is merely the pure eye itself, and the disrupted consciousness in itself, this pure self-identity of self-consciousness that is returned to itself. We end this section with paragraph 526, which... I should point out, ends with a movement to this, this higher level. He says the positive object 
uh, by this time is merely the pure I itself, something we've encountered many times, which are now going to take a, a new determinate form and the disrupted consciousness in itself, uh, this, this pure identity of self-consciousness that has returned to itself. So the disrupted consciousness is, you might say, in a certain sense, being sloughed off, or at least it seems so at this time. And how do we get to that point? Well, Hegel here is going to, a little bit uh, earlier in this, this paragraph, which is quite a long paragraph, he's going to talk about the contradiction, the Widerspruch being the truth, the Wahrheit, that self-consciousness has, has realized. So rather than arriving at a truth which is sort of a coherent, uh, cohesive everything, you know, making sense, fitting in together, is rather a realization that these parts don't align with each other. And because of that, because of its own consciousness being tied in with it, it doesn't have a sort of place it can, it can withdraw itself to and be a, a unified consciousness, at least not a consciousness of the individual within the world, because that very contradic contradiction, you might say, infects it. So let's look at what he says. He says, in that, that aspect of the return to itself, what is that aspect of the return to itself? This, this move to the object that is the beyond, the Jainzeits of this world and of its own consciousness. It says, the vanity of all things is its own vanity. It is itself vain. And we talked just a moment ago about, you know, Eitelkeit and, and what it means in its, its primary sense. Um, so we've got the vanity of things as individual things, as not just individual objects, but also understood in terms of, say, powers or, or moral qualifications such as good and bad, um, of the world as a totality, and also of the self. All of these are revealed as, as vain. So he says, it's the self-centered self that knows. Now, self-centered self is a little bit of a Tricky translation here. I, I think that it does make sense that Miller chose that. Um, für sich seiende selbst, right, is, is what he's talking about there. Selbst, is, of course, is the self. Um, für sich seiende, um, being for itself, the kind of self that has this reflexivity that is attentive to its own position, that's paying, you know, uh, some, some sort of attention, not just to the world, but how it's seeing the world and whether it's right about that or wrong about that, right? That's part of what it means to be, to be for itself. So in this case, I think Miller's translation is not that close, but it is felicitous. Insofar as we're in this stage, we're not just sort of losing ourselves in this, this contradictory world of culture. We're holding ourselves back as, you might say, a consumer. Or, um, you know, another way of putting it, as Hegel talks about it here, is as a judge, as a, in the old sense of judge, critic, right? Um, so it does actually make sense. So let, let's come back now to the passage. So this, this self-centered self knows not only how to pass judgment, but urteilen, on and shatter, uh, beschwätzen, uh, about everything. Um, these are the, the modes in which it is engaging the world. Shattering, you know, saying things about it, this, this idle or witty chatter, and then making judgments, actually deciding what things are a little bit deeper. He says, um, it also knows how to give witty expression to the contradiction that is present in the solid elements of the actual world as also in the fixed determinations posited by judgment. So even in the act of engaging in judgments, it's realizing that those judgments themselves are not entirely what they would pretend to be. And this is not the skepticism that says, oh, I should withhold judgment. I should engage in what the Greeks, the skeptics called epoche, you know, sort of holding uh, away from those things. Or, you know, as, as the, the Stoics and then later, of course, 
uh, Descartes and, well, so many people in between them talked about, you know, suspend the judgment a little while. Don't, don't give assent to it right away. That's not what's happening here. Judgment is being engaged in, but the knowledge is that those fixed determinations of the judgment themselves are not as solid, are not as reliable as one would like them to be. So it seems that everything is, in a way, up for grabs. He goes on and here's where he says their contradiction is their truth. The, The truth that's been arrived at, the insight, the wisdom, is that things are contradictory, not just to each other, but also to themselves. The good isn't totally good. The bad isn't totally bad. And we could go on and on with examples, as we've done for paragraph after paragraph, so I don't need to rehearse this. Now, he says, look at it from the point of view of form. And this is where it gets very interesting. What do we have going on here? He says, it knows everything to be self-alienated. Not just alienated from everything else, self-alienated. Within anything that we, we look at that has, you might say, the least trace of subjectivity, being in itself and being for itself are not harmoniously con- coinciding. In addition to this, being for another. We notice we don't just have being for itself and in itself, also being for another is not exactly coinciding, say, with its being Uh, in itself or its being for itself. We have a contradiction that's more complicated than just two things contradicting each other. So he goes on and he says, um, here we go, from the point of view of form, it knows everything to be self-alienated, being for itself is separated from being in itself. What is meant and purpose from truth? And from both, again, the being for another, the ostensible meaning from the real meaning, from the true thing and intention. Notice that he's talking here about what is meant, right? What is intended. Um, He's talking about the language that we're using or the, if we want to go a little bit broader, the communication, because we can, we can communicate not just with words, but with our actions and with our affects and with our attitudes towards each other. Um, None of these things are actually matching up to each other. So we have an incoherent, let's say uh, a locally coherent, but globally incoherent world uh, full of contradictory things that nonetheless, we still have to wend our way through and make sense out of, at least to get through each day. So what else can we say? He says this, this, this self-centered uh, you know, self um, knows how to give correct expression to each moment in relation to its opposite. So it's sophisticated. It understands how to get by in this world, how to make sense out of this world, how to judge things. He says it knows better than each what each is, no matter what its specific nature is. Since it knows the substantial from the side of disunion and conflict which are united within the substantial itself, but not from the side of this union. It understands very well how to pass judgment on it. Now notice this key point here that Hegel is saying. It understands how to pass judgment on it, but it has lost the ability to comprehend it. It doesn't fully understand, or let me back up a little bit. We must distinguish here between we might say two senses of understanding, one of which encompasses the thing and does so in a way that actually overcomes those contradictions, that harmonizes them. This is the realm of the concept for Hegel, the begriff. And then there's understanding in the sense that we more typically use it, understanding how, understanding that. And this gets a lot but it's not able to carry out that synthesis, that process of of conceptualizing it in the full sense. It can picture it, it can imagine it, it can make judgments on it, it can take it apart, it can show where the contradictions lie, but it cannot actually overcome or reconcile the contradictions. This is a very important point. 
<clears throat> this distinction, by the way, between different levels, we might say, of understanding, this is not one that Hegel's coming up with on the spot, although it does have its own peculiar spin because of Hegel's stress on the begriff, the concept, the notion. This has been running throughout philosophy from really the time of Plato and Aristotle all the way through the medievals and well into the modern age, where Hegel thought it got lost sight of. He criticizes, in other works, the philosophy of the understanding, which doesn't grasp that there is a difference between understanding and some higher faculty. Well, let's go on. So, he says, This vanity at the same time needs the vanity of all things in order to get from them the consciousness of self. The person here has become, you might say, almost addicted to a world that doesn't fully make sense or cannot find who they are outside of that. If the world suddenly did make sense, they would lose their reason for being, whatever it happens to be. So he says, let's look at two things that we began with, power and wealth. These were taken as being actual spiritual powers, as things we could rely upon. It says power and wealth are the supreme ends of its exertions. It knows through renunciation and sacrifice, it forms itself into the universal, attains the possession of it. This, in this possession is universally recognized and accepted. Where did we see this? This is the noble consciousness and in doing its work for the state power. Then he says, this recognition and acceptance is vain. This is a very important point. The recognition that it's been seeking this entire time, which is at the very core of self-consciousness, to have honor canon. Uh, to, to, to understand what you are, where you fit, the meaning of your life, can only be granted in part through the mediation of the other, and what you're getting from the other turns out to be vain in this case. That's a big problem. So he goes on and he says, um, state power and wealth are the real and acknowledged powers, but this uh, recognition and acceptance is vain. By taking possession of power, by taking possession of wealth, it knows them to be without a self of their own. Knows that it is the power over them. The individual is the power over them. They are vain things. So he says... In its witty talk, it's able to demonstrate this. It, it, it possess, it's a part and beyond them, right? This is exhibited in its witty talk, which therefore becomes its supreme interest. Why does that become its supreme interest? Because that's more important. Because that actually is closer to the reality of things than these shadows over here that seem to be dominating society. So he says, in such talk, this particular self, qua this pure self, determined neither by reality nor by thought. Isn't that an interesting way to put it? Determined neither by reality nor by thought. Well, what the hell does that mean? Well, determined, made to be what it is, neither by thought, the universal, nor by the realities that it's encountering. What is determining it then? This is where we have, although Hegel's not using the word here, the realm of human freedom, right? Self-determining. That's something that human beings do. So he says, it develops into a spiritual self that is of truly universal worth. This is where the new transition is coming in. So he says, it is the self-disruptive nature of all relationships and the conscious disruption of them, but only as self-consciousness in revolt is it aware of its disrupted state? So long as it remains, to go a little bit back further, trying to hold on to, maybe I could be the noble consciousness. Maybe, this, maybe I could invest myself here or here and the world would make sense. Maybe, 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 if you know, any of these risks uh, are still you know, engaged in and there isn't a kind of knowing despair at this point of, wow, this, this really is all I've got here and none of it, adds up to what it was supposed to be in the first place. If you don't pass through that, you can't move on, Hegel's saying, to this point, to the spiritual self that has truly universal significance. And what is this going to be framed as? For Hegel, the positive object becomes the pure eye itself. The disrupted consciousness, you might say, is just a way to get us there, right? And this is the return to itself. 
Now, this has only been accomplished, as we started out by saying here, in principle, um, we have an entire section ahead of us to map out where we're going. But what, what is Hegel talking about here? He mentioned in the previous paragraph a heaven, a beyond. Um, here he's talking about the pure eye and talking about thought. What he's really going to be discussing in the next section, though, is faith or belief. How is that going to fit in here? Well, this closes this section, and we'll find out that as we move into the new material.